joking about the notes we took of things that maybe stood out during the press conference. And to <laughs> me, that did. And I went back because at first I was like, which still would have been I- impressive. But I was like, did he say one of his all-time favorite point guards? No, he said one of his all-time favorite players. Players. And the words that he used are what stood out to me most. The one being creativity, the skill set. Um, I can't remember all the – but they – to think about the fact, and you bring up both Nash and Jason Kidd and the thought of them as, but they are savants and their understanding of just how to absolutely pick apart defenses. Um, and the forward thinking of just seeing the game develop and with someone like Kyrie Irving, I mean, we, we only saw glimpses or not quite as much as we would have liked to last season. But the one thing I took away from last year and watching him and I knew how talented he was. I, was thrilled to have an opportunity to think, man, we get to see this guy every night and call it seeing him on a near nightly basis. And, you know, for how much that we did prior to the injuries, uh, it was mind blowing because you watch just the way in which the rhythm that he dances with the ball and how he's able to see things on the floor and cut through defenses and finish in a row, like all the stuff, the shooter that he is. I continue to be wowed with his type of talent. And so to think about those two guys together and how they could bounce ideas off of one another in the understanding that Steve Nash, he was in those shoes. He was in that position. He had that type of talent. This is a two-time MVP, a hall of famer. Um, I, I think there is, there are a few things more important than that on top of the fact that the other thing that stood out to me with the press conference in relation to this, um, Steve Nash, and I I don't think he was saying it just to say it, it it felt sincere and from the heart. When he was talking about Kyrie, he also closed by saying just the person, the the generous acts and the way in which he was giving back to the community off the court. Sarah, when when you look at coaches right now in 2020 and you look at this team, specifically the Brooklyn Nets, they have two, two, a superstar and a star, two superstars, whatever you want to say. And there are championship aspirations as we knew were going to come, especially in this coming season. How much important is it to have a coach, which I think Steve Nass is being asked to do, to manage these superstars and manage, you know, it's not just the X's and O's. It's it's somebody you kind of mentioned about that, connecting with the players. Is that kind of what we're looking for in terms of coaches now? And maybe this is the way we should sort of look at this Steve Nash hire as somebody who can relate to and also coach these players because he's done it before at a very high level. Yeah, I mean, I think we, I think we, as we look at it as the media, as fans, I feel like we just always want everything, and there's such high expectations on what a head coach is supposed to offer. And it, when you look at the, this is a players' league, and this is a superstar-driven league. So part of it is, is yes, that connection and managing personalities. And I believe in a, in a um, interview Sean Marks gave to Woj, he had, he'd spelled out the important factors um, that. Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving had said, and Dexter, you're nodding your head, you know, about um, the respect level, communication, and I'm I'm missing what the third factor was. Um, But to me, that's folded in the the idea of respecting someone, um, the idea of your ability to communicate and communicate what you want and what you need. And even for this group, you know, with someone like that, he... I keep going back to this press conference. I didn't think there was that much stuff I was going to glean from it. And, <laughs> and now, um, but he, but he, he was asked a question of, about handling superstars, the relationships. Um, I believe our friend Tim Bontemps asked it in, in saying, did, did having played with or been around, you know, X, Y, Z players help you have that type of experience as you enter, as you enter into this, um, to this role. And, and Steve got a look at it, like he, he thought about it and he looked at it. And I think his, the beginning of his response is like, well, I don't look at those guys that way. Like they're my friends. And to me, there was this blinging light of like, he is a superstar. He is a superstar too. So he's not looking at how, how, gosh, how am I going to manage these superstars now that are, that I'm coaching? He, he is one with all of that. So I think that's why, um, his ability, yes, to, to manage different players. And it's not just for as much as we're talking about Kevin and Kyrie, it's about the entire roster. How do you get everyone to buy in? And how do you make sure everyone understands their roles? How do you get everyone, if you're really talking about contending for a title, 
how do you get everyone to be their best to fit into this broad picture? Um, but you can't overlook that there are still the same requirements that everyone expects okay, you better be able to drop a good play or you better be able to, whether it's substitution patterns or timeouts or what you're running. I mean, there's so many things we see um, that you still got to be able to handle the X's and O's. And that's where I think the coaching staff as a whole comes in. Um, the development of guys, how do, you know, for Kevin and Kyrie, I think the opportunity to actually learn and, and to get better and to improve their games. Um, so while I think, you know, you focus on his ability and if he will bring a certain level of um, that cachet, that respect to be able to relate with different guys. I also think there's so many other factors. That, and that to me is where I think the experience of having played as a superstar in the league for 18 years or so, um, you've been through it. You know what works. You know what doesn't work. You know the different personalities of different guys. You know how important you know, the 12th guy is the, you know, whoever it is on the roster. Um, so again, those are the type of things that I think there is a different level of expectation and um, optimism for why he may be able to slide into this role. I was glad you mentioned that, that Woj interview with Sean Marks, because something that stuck, stuck, stuck out to me in that interview was Sean said that Steve treated when his time in Phoenix, those two seasons they played together, he treated the superstars, the guys like Amare and Sean Marion that he played with the same way he treated Sean, who was like the 15th guy <laughs> on that roster, right? The last guy on the bench. And that, even though they have a connection through there, that really st stuck out to me, Sarah. I have to ask you this before we let you go. Now, this we, we've talked about the championship aspirations. We know that this this team has, and they've gotten to a certain level. We, You and I and Brian have all been around the Nets, and they built up the culture. We had all this talk about that. How much pressure do you think is on this team uh, next year? And what do you think they need to do to get to that championship level? Because there still could be work to be done. There's talk about possibly trading for a third star. What do you think this team needs to do to reach the mountaintop? We've all been around. Are you? Did, did any part of you have flashbacks to that Sports Illustrated cover? Um, oh. With Garnett and, oh. Kidd and Pier is uh, who wants a piece of this yes. or us? Do you remember yeah. that? Do, do you remember that press <laughs> card, the introductory press conference? I do. Yes. I do. <laughs> I know that's not where you're going with this, but I had to slide in for people to talk so much about Reba. I'm like, they, that was, yeah, if hindsight, hindsight always matters. Uh, yeah. um, but back to back to your original question. I I I don't know, and I I'm curious how much the fluidity, uncertainty, given the times of COVID, given what's happening with the league, how that changes things or affects things or factors into you know whether it's what's going to happen on, on the trade market or you know if if you look to move pieces. I mean, I think, and, and I don't know, and I don't have the answers. To this and I think I could probably argue a point of, of any which way about um, you know the, the roster as it sits and what you want and what you're looking for um, I, I think the one thing you know is that we haven't seen especially with Kevin you know Durant being out the this you know however many months um, we haven't seen all these guys on the floor together we saw you know we saw small parts with with Kyrie and being able to play with Karis and, and Spencer but then you know with some of the injuries of Karis so I don't think we really know so I think a big part um, whatever happens and it shakes out and whatever the roster ends up looking like as they enter into next season I think a big part is just going to be you know the understanding that both of the, the two key components, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, are coming off surgery. So it may take a little time. There may take some time for everyone to come together. you got a new head coach and a new coaching staff and figuring out style of play and understanding the pieces and how they all fit. Um, but I think just the talent is clearly there. And when you yeah. have the talent at the top, um, that is so important. And now the way the East looks and who knows how exactly it will, of course, play out the rest of this postseason, but look, going into next season, I mean, there is that to me adds more reason for optimists because there's no, you know, for what's happening with Milwaukee or, you know, how is Philly going to look? Boston, of course, they've got a lot of young, but, you know, how does that change the dynamic of things? Um, and again, heading it on paper, looking at the roster, looking at the personnel. That's why I think, you know, there's uh, many, many reasons for the Nets to think, despite the fact that there may be some moving parts and maybe some, some, you know, time given to acclimate themselves and shake off some rust. There's a lot of reasons that those goals and, and those 
you know, expectations that they have seem very realistic. See, and and that's something that I've thought about where I'm I'm struggling to see a world right now where Kyrie, Kevin Durant, and Karis LeVert, and Jared Allen, and Joe Harris, and Spencer Dinwiddie, like, how are they going to make that work? Not in terms of play style, but just by salary cap numbers. Joe Harris is supposed to hit free agency. We don't even know what that's going to look like because of COVID and Hong Kong. Uh, we don't know, like, how that stuff is going to affect the salary cap. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie has a player option that he's obviously not going to exercise and probably offer free agency in 2021. That makes him uh, or his contract the trade asset. That makes him a piece that's going to be valuable to somebody. And Karis LeVert, they signed him to that extension, but it's kind of a team-friendly extension where they can move off it, when, you know, however they want. Tory and Prince's deal the same way. So I am I think that there has to be a trade at some point. I'm not going to ask who do you think they can get because we can – you know, go on for days about that. But, you know, is it crazy to think that we're just going to see a different team than we think we are at this point, even with COVID and all these things? Like, there's there's a high probability, for me at least, that Karis LeVert or Spencer Dinwiddie or Jared Allen, like one or two of those three guys may not be back. Yeah, and I, I don't know the answers to that, and I don't even have any, you know, true educated guesses, because to your point, there are so many moving factors you look at. You look at not only just, you know, the salaries and where they sit with that, but the different contracts. Um, looking at this group, you're not just thinking, I mean, you are, but about this season, but the next the next few seasons, how does that factor in? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would probably be more surprised. Um, I shouldn't say that. I just, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see changes, if we see some movements. Um, and not even because of the fact that, some of these pieces or players wouldn't be beneficial to a team or to a title team. Exactly. But just given the fact that there, there are a lot of really, really good assets that the Nets have. Um, and does it bode better for the Nets to keep them, to have them with this group or um, to try and move them? Um, so I think that's, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And that's why I think there's just a lot of different factors. That's why I'm curious again, back to the point, you know, whether it's COVID or whether it's just, you know, where the things sit, the salary cap, everything getting pushed back within the course of the league, how that factors in for not only this group, but also for other teams. And does that change the way in which the other, you know, other 29 teams try and move and what they're doing with their own rosters? 